Hello. It's a pleasure to see you all here tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Naomi Slip. I am the Douglas and Cynthia Crocker Endowed Chair for the Chief Curator here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Uh, and it's my pleasure uh, um, to share this exhibition and, and project with you all. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, Reframing the View, 19th Century American Landscapes is an exhibition that um, could not happen alone. Um, its execution is thanks to the generosity of our many lenders, funders, supporters, and staff, um, and I'm grateful to all of them for their generosity and, and the work that they've put into executing this project together. Um, I do have one note. Hopefully everyone had a moment to go into the exhibition and, and see it in person. Um, uh, uh, we have been subject to the, the vagaries of politics, and uh, we do have temporary labels in the exhibition because we've gotten bumped on the print schedule uh, with the election next week. So uh, we anticipate seeing them tomorrow, which is the official opening day of the exhibition, uh, 9 a.m. Uh, any visitor can come in and enjoy the show. Um, so reframing the view uh, explores the many meanings of the American landscape. Tonight, in a talk titled Environmental Illusions, we're gonna explore one thread from the exhibition. There are many, um, and hopefully they've inspired you to, to question and, and think about what landscapes might have meant uh, in the past and today. Um, so this evening, we're gonna explore how 19th century American landscapes can help us think critically about the pressing environmental concerns of the past and our present. And by looking at these historical landscapes, I hope that together we can uh, re-envision a better future. So no small task. <laughs> um, so I think Jocelyn is gonna turn down the lights a little bit so we can enjoy these beautiful works of art uh, and talk a little bit more about them. I'm gonna put this mic back to you. Okay. So it's easy to look at a landscape painting and think of it as a window, as a faithful transcription of scenery viewed by the artist and recorded exactly as it was observed. But we must remember that every artwork is a construction, a form of artifice, an object that is made by an artist, not in a vacuum, but in response to many external forces, influences, social conditions, and historical events. And by way of illustration, I thought we could start by looking at James Augustus Soydam's view of Conway Meadows, made in 1857 and exhibited to much public acclaim at exhibitions in 1858, at the New York Athenaeum, the Boston Athenaeum, and the Washington DC Art Association. The painting was likely informed as much by Soydem's summer residencies in North Conway, New Hampshire, as it was by his engagement with the New York art scene, where he had a studio in the noted 10th Street Studio Building with a number of other important luminaries of the period. While the painting may have been inspired by sketches on plein air, meaning painted out of doors, the work is not photographic. Instead, the artist made choices to emphasize certain areas, include or omit details, and frame the composition in a particular way. In this case, Soydem presents North Conway Meadows with Mount Washington in the far distance, almost wholly obscured by trees. You can't even see that, that peak there. The placid waters of the Seco River rush along in the foreground. And Soydem positions us as the viewer really low in the composition rather than in an elevated location, grounding us in an intimate pastoral landscape. The empty rowboat on the riverbank invites us to imagine a calm journey by boat through this fall scene. The work is a picture made for pleasurable viewing. It is meant to be picturesque the term literally meaning, right? Pretty as a picture. In contrast, fellow artist Benjamin Champney chose a more traditional view of the North Conway Meadow for an afternoon fishing in the White Mountains of 1869, where two fishermen sit on the grassy banks of the river. And they are right here. And uh, against a, oops, sorry. <laughs> 
Two fishermen sit on the grassy banks of the river, cows stand on the other side, autumnal foliage and the scene reflected off the placid water draw the eye to the middle of the composition where the peak of Mount Washington rises upward into a pristine sky. For Champney, the scene is all about the mountain in the distance, very different from Soydam. He also made this the subject of an 1870 lithograph, presenting the same bend in the river and bank with bent trees, but opts to pull back and provide a really wide view and that deep panoramic vista of the mountains beyond. The inclusion of haystacks and people laboring or prominent overtaking the foreground in a way contrary to Soydem. Well, I want us to keep the constructed nature of pictures in our mind as we look at landscapes together this evening, we should also be mindful of the fact that these views very often do serve as records of real landscapes that were shaped by people who molded the land, cleared the field, or banked the river. Such landscapes were sculpted by human hands and by the very earth itself. Both Champney and Soydem depict landscapes constructed by the movement of the earth. Geological forces drive mountains into being. Glacial activity carves out ponds and lakes and produces meltwater streams, and the relentless action of water slowly erodes the land, creating riverbanks, ravines, and canyons. Yet human activity is also evoked in these scenes. We should note agricultural activity that necessitates clearing large forested areas, the construction of roads and bridges, the introduction of non-native plants, in this case haying across multiple fields, and the active management, diversion, and use of water for things like mill and factory production, which are all hinted at in the paintings by Champney and by Soydem. In the 1760s, settlers began damming the ravines around Conway building a sawmill and gristmill powered by the mill stream. They cut timber from the banks and floated the logs to the mill. Industry flourished across the 19th century when companies established factories along the river to use the water to power machinery. Over the decades, the embankments rose with accretions of stones, stumps, and refuse, lifting the water level higher and higher, and eventually turning what had been a small pond into what is now Conway Lake that we see in the photograph right here. A community sp sprang up around the mills. The area underwent further expansion and development when tourism to the White Mountains increased and a rail line was established. And the railroad transported freight, uh, mostly wood products, away from Conway and brought tourists to Conway. Numerous inns and taverns were built to support the burgeoning tourism industry. And you have the train station in the photograph up at the top. So as we see here then in this example, human activity impacts the landscape in immeasurable ways. Taking this example then as a starting point, tonight I wanna emphasize how 19th century American landscapes can help us to understand the historical influences on the physical landscape, the cultural pressures that impacted an artist's rendering of that place, and the environmental factors that might have affected and continue to affect such landscapes today. But first, let's think a little bit about what landscape meant for 19th century American artists. So we'll start with the so-called father of American landscape painting, Thomas Cole, who in 1836 published an essay called Essay on American Scenery, where he described how every American should be interested in the country's varied landscape. Um, and he describes parts of it here in this little quote. He says, <clears throat> whether he beholds the Hudson mingling waters with the Atlantic, explores the central wilds of the vast continent or stands on the margin of the distant Oregon. This is his own land. Its beauty, its magnificence, its sublimity, all are his. Now Cole was arguing that for the uniqueness of an American scene and advocating for the advantages of cultivating a taste for scenery within US citizens. This is because he believed, and many like him in the 1830s, that Americans should appreciate the native beauty on their own shores rather than traveling to Europe to study other art and then emulating it when they came back. Cole took inspiration, ironically, from French landscape artists like Claude Lorraine, who we see in the work on the left, and from British landscapists like John Constable, who we see on the right. Both artists set the standards for what a traditional landscape painting should look like. 
You often have trees framing a view. You have a pathway or a river that runs straight down the middle. Your eye is meant to be drawn through the three parts of the picture, the foreground, the very front, the middle ground, the kind of center band, and then deep into the background where usually you have some nice mountains or some picturesque thing that, that draws you in there. And you'll notice that both Constable and um, Lorraine here are also using light to guide your eye directly back into that picture. So Cole and many of the artists who come after him follow these traditions, but they do it by depicting American scenery. While 19th century Americans might not have thought of the landscape in the exact ecological terms that we do today, they were not oblivious to the ways in which human occupation was having an effect on once bucolic places. Indeed, Thomas Cole was deeply aware of and concerned about the changing appearance of America's landscapes. Part of his urgency in encouraging Americans to paint nature was his fear that it was quickly disappearing. He wrote, I cannot but express my sorrow that the beauty of such landscapes are quickly passing away. The ravages of the axe are daily increasing, the most noble scenes made desolate, and oftentimes with a wantonness and barbarism scarcely credible in a civilized nation, the wayside is becoming shadeless, and another generation will behold spots now rife with beauty, desecrated by what is called improvement. And in this painting of River and the Catskills from 1843, we see two really unique features. We see the train off in the distance that you can see in a detail here, running straight through the middle of the composition. And in the foreground, a figure with the parts of a tree scattered all around him holding an ax. And you see that detail here. So in light of this, Cole's paintings of America's woodlands and waterfalls, mountains and rivers are redolent with a kind of anxiety about the imminent destruction of the American landscape. And Cole's thoughts about this that he publishes in the 1830s open a doorway for us to think more widely about 19th century landscape paintings as commentary on or reflections of these environmental changes and the human impact on the land. So this evening we're going to look at a group of works of art that depict particularly coastal spaces and tidal zones, areas where the land meets the sea, appropriate for our venue here uh, and our location. And such landscapes, as I hope we'll see, illuminate the historical management of things like coastal erosion, um, the shoreline economies of the working classes, the industrialization of the waterfront, and the impacts of climate change and rising sea levels on landscapes and communities today. Uh, almost the entirety of our shared history uh, is one reliant on coasts. As the historian John R. Gillis has written, we need to stop looking at history as something that emanates from centers and begin to think of it as something that has its origins and dynamics on the margins. Coasts are a chief margin. They are central to these shared histories and increasingly under threat. Climate change is devastating coastal communities, as we all are widely aware, precipitating stronger storms and transforming the landscape of the coast. This twinned with ocean pollution, overdevelopment, and global sea level rise promises to be one of the most significant challenges that we face today in the 21st century. We got a little bit of you know a little bit of numbers here, a little bit of uh, of the hard science. Um, global mean sea level has risen eight or nine inches since 1880, when these artists were painting the landscape. A third of that, scientists have noted, has occurred in the last 25 years. In 2020, global sea level rise set a record high, and that rate is accelerating, predicted to double, uh, more than double per year. Scientists estimate the average sea level rise for the contiguous United States could be over 7 feet by 2100 and 13 feet by 2150. So what does this mean for us on the coast and for views of the coast? Well, it's useful to look at some examples. Think about how these pictures of the past can help us think about our moment today. Thomas Moran's 1916 painting of dunes at East Hampton celebrates the varied terrain of Long Island's sandy marsh landscape. Moran's mastery of color and light is on full view in this stunning painting. The glistening tones of green, amber, and blue sit starkly against the muted color of the sand. Texturally, Moran explores the concavity of the dune, 
in, particularly in this area here. Its shape designated by impasto, the texture that implies erosion, that the sand is slipping away. A sliver of bright blue at left draws the eye into the composition, and above it is the peak of a very tall dune. Moran paints foreboding dark storm clouds and horizontal sweeps of gray brushwork that suggest torrential rain right here. This is a summer storm on the Atlantic coast. Moran was attached to the landscape of East Hampton, living there uh, with his family from 1878 until his death in 1926. Uh, train tracks had recently been extended to make the island just a three-hour train ride from Manhattan. The Moran Studio and Home in East Hampton was built in 1884 as the summer gathering place for extended family, an overlooked goose pond where both Thomas and his wife, fellow artist Mary Nemo, found inspiration in the flat, grassy terrain and abundant waterways. The couple who married in 1864 had three children. During her lifetime, along with raising the children and taking care of their home, Mary Nemo Moran's etchings earned critical praise for their directness and boldness. She worked directly from nature, etching scenes of uh, East Hampton and also New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, and other areas close to where they were. And we see that in the Goose Pond, Long Island at right. Thomas Moran also adopted etching occasionally, as in this 1880 image, looking over the sand dunes in East Hampton. Here, we're positioned at the peak of the dune, with a view toward the left, with a marshy pond and scrub brushes, and to the right, toward sandy beach and crashing waves. Today, such a view would be impossible. As many of us know, right? Now we have big built stairs up over the dunes and blockades that keep us from clambering over them. Sand dunes such as these protect some of the most biologically productive areas of our coastline. As such, their value as protective features into the ecosystem is imperative. And today, the town of East Hampton recognizes this, outlining in their current bylaws how the value of dunes and bluffs in protecting the town's coastlands cannot be overstated. But most especially, they see the dunes as important as a measure against coastal flooding and for erosion control. So currents carry massive amounts of sand in and out, leaving beaches unstable. Hurricanes add a seasonal threat to the constant risk of groundwater flooding and rising sea levels. And storms drive water across sandy reaches and open up new inlets in their wake. The water around Montauk and um, the areas where Moran was painting has risen about 10 inches in the past 70 years and continues to go up. Long Island has made significant investments in dune replenishment projects, sandbagging and dredging. Just last fall, East Hampton spent almost a million dollars on sand to help restore what was carried off by currents and storms in the perpetual ebb and flow intensified by rising seas. The realities of climate change, though, mean dune and beach restoration is just a temporary fix. Over the next 30 years, the federal government will invest approximately $1.5 billion to shore up about 83 miles of Long Island waterfront as part of the Fire Island to Montauk Point Project, FIMP, which is directed by the US Army Corps of Engineers. And in that pilot project, they'll be testing out a new way to replenish beaches and dunes that may be employed in other parts of the country. Dredges will pump offshore sand onto the beaches, and thousands of beachyard homes, in cooperation with their owners, will be lifted off their foundations and up onto stilts. Um, rising sea levels uh, undoubtedly are impacting communities up and down the eastern coast. Uh, thinking about how we can create and pilot management projects like this uh, is one way that we can perhaps come up with answers to the current crisis. Turning to another example of coastal erosion underscores this question. What is the, um, excuse me, when is restoration the right response? When is it time to halt efforts at reclamation and preservation? How do we find that balance? How do we know the answer? Newport, Rhode Island is addressing such questions in relation to the beloved oceanfront cliff walk, a scenic three and a half mile trail that winds along Ochre Point between private homes and the ocean on the eastern side of town. In March of 2022, a 
20-foot section of the cliff walk came crashing down into the oceanfront below. The section remains close to the public, and officials are unsure when or if it will be repaired. This followed devastating damage to the cliff walk incurred during Superstorm Sandy, which happened in 2012 and caused catastrophic destruction from the Caribbean all the way up the eastern seaboard. In 1871, the Maryland-born painter John Ross Key rendered his painting, The Cliffs of Newport, Rhode Island. The painting is strongly horizontal, uh, cut across in the middle ground by a violet horizon line where ocean meets, that meets sky. Stif steep cliffs rise at right, stretching backward and towering over the shoreline. The scale of the landscape is apparent if you can pick out from your seats the tiny figures teetering along the cliff's edge. And they're right there, little teeny tiny people. While the water appears relatively calm in this scene, the regular violence of the waves and fierceness of the wind are obvious in the rugged incline of the cliff side and the barren, flat, open expanse of land at the top. The painting clearly documents ongoing problems with cliffside erosion and underscores the geological conditions of this popular seaside tourist destination. Key's painting bridges two concerns. The modern economic expansion of Newport via a burgeoning tourism industry, which required the preservation of popular public sites and landscapes, and emerging environmental concerns about coastal erosion and the burgeoning field of geology. In this way, Key's painting provides a window into concerns over the composition of the earth and its instabilities relative to the ongoing commercial viability of a growing local tourist destination. The development of Newport's famed summer cottages began in the 1850s with homes like Chateau-sur-Mer and reached its apogee with the breaker's completion in 1895. The cliff walk was transformed during these decades, undergoing serious development starting in 1880. It was popular with locals, tourists, and summer residents who increasingly came to the summer colony after 1865. But you'll notice in Key's picture from 1871, there's nothing there. This is well before the breakers, well before the development of houses out along the cliff walk. Now as seen in this period photograph, here on the bottom left, by 1880, Newport was already utilizing um, different kinds of erosion mitigation tactics, including the erection of retaining walls. These hard-faced stone walls were and continue to be a popular option for preventing coastal erosion, but recent studies indicate increasingly that especially in tidal areas, hard engineered structures like these can provide protection, but also change the contours of the coastline around them. They can halt the natural soil depletion of one area and lead to deposits in another. And certainly the wave action continues against them and their longevity is often in question. And another period photograph shows this, uh, where we can see the kind of continued action along the cliffs that are eroding the side of them. A contemporary photograph on the upper right shows that this erosion continues. Today, what may once have been a slow process of um, erosion and deposit is now an accelerating crisis. The management of the cliff walk has proven challenging, due in large part to the geological composition of Aquidneck Island which is composed of lots of different rock formations, many of which were deposited uh, millennia ago from volcanic and glacial activity. And coincident with the rise of Newport as a tourist destination, increasing numbers of geologists began visiting the area in the 1860s, at the same time that Key started being drawn to that area, to study the composition of the rocks there and understand the geological forces that literally shaped the earth millions of years before. During this period, there was a burgeoning national interest in geology that was inspired by the work of scientists like Alexander von Humboldt and Louis Agassiz, who came up with theories about volcanic and glacial activity um, as the foundations of the modern science. The activities of the U.S. Geological Survey were also a big part of the burgeoning interest in geology. Key's career was shaped by these developments in the field of geology, 
In the 1850s, he served as a topographical artist for the United States Coast Survey, charting America's coastlines and rendering them in elevation maps and in engravings. Studied by amateur geologists and painted by Key, the cliffs of Newport render visible the geology of the region. And when Key visited, it was not the mansions or displays of wealth that drew him to this piece of coastline, for they did not yet exist. Instead, he came to witness the extraordinary geology made evident through the ongoing forces of coastal erosion. This painting was made when geological thought and discussion about theories of deep time and Earth's historical formation were in the public eye. And if you notice, if you can see from where you are, in the foreground of the picture, um, Key takes care to trace the curves and contours of the cliff face. And there's actually ridges of paint that draw out that kind of um, edge of, of the cliff where it's been broken away by the force of the water. It's almost as, key, as if Key is trying to manifest the rocky ledges in three dimensions to give us the texture of stone and dirt and pick out the fleck and veining of granite and conglomerate. The 2022 collapse of 20 feet of the cliff walk occurred directly adjacent to uh, Bun Rock, which is the place that Key paints, this little fixture right here. Um, so it's intriguing to think about Key coming here in 1871 and identifying this place and then this being the very location that um, uh, collapses just this past year. Reading this painting then allows us to think about how audiences in the 1870s may have viewed this landscape and think about the space in the present. Now alongside dunes and cliffs, estuaries and marshlands are also susceptible to environmental change. Estuaries and marshes particularly, being places where often fresh and salt water can mix in dynamic environments. The interactions between the wave and the tides, the atmosphere, the flow of rivers and wetlands, the temperature and salinity changes that occur here, the sediments that are deposited, the creatures that live within these unique spaces, um, all create a distinctive ecosystem. And these areas are constantly in flux, flux, shifting across the tidal action of the day and the seasonal habitats of uh, a month or a year. Martin Johnson Heed's rendering of Newburyport Marshes shows the marsh on Massachusetts's North Shore near the Merrimack River as pastoral, bathed in golden purple light of the setting sun. A large pile of marsh hay is backlit against the sunset. In the distance, the rounded shapes of haystacks hulk against the sky. And although the scene is absent of people, the haystacks themselves almost take on a human presence. The painting is a study of unique atmosphere and light, and a scene of coastal agricultural activity, salt marsh hang. This work records the changing environs of the marsh and preserves an industry that was coming to an end. Heed, who worked predominantly in New York City, painted the subject consistently for over 45 years and produced almost 120 individual views of marshes. He was obsessed. <laughs> He showed them in every condition of light and at all times of day. And in each, he exaggerates the proportion of the marsh by setting a very low horizon line and by creating extremely horizontal pictures. So his paintings are actually one high to three wide. So you get this really wide kind of band. And that extreme horizontality and the low vanishing point draws your eye all the way in the picture and makes the edges of the marsh seem to stretch out far beyond the confines of the frame. You can imagine that marsh going on forever in both directions. Now in this version, Heat is really focusing on the light from the setting sun, which is casting these beautiful pink and yellow tones across the blades of the grass. Um, we can tell that the grass is reflecting the light from the setting sun because there's greener grass in the foreground. And those bright yellow clouds hint that the color in this picture is fleeting, maybe just a few moments more before the color dissolves. In a similar composition from 1876 to around 1881, we see an altogether different time of day and weather effect. Here, it's midday, and the marsh sits under a stormy sky. Sunlight breaks through gray clouds heavy with rain, and a raking downpour descends in the distance. Figures in the middle hurry to fork the hay onto the wagon, which is already mounted high. 
Now, marshlands in the 1870s were pretty contested spaces, especially in towns like Marshfield, Massachusetts, which had allowed land, rec land reclamation, excuse me, to dike and infill marshes for alternate agricultural purposes. Essentially, they filled them in so they could use them in other ways. Some people fought to leave them as open spaces for recreation, hunting, and the harvesting of marsh hay, which was used for cattle. In that case, salt grass was cut by hand in summer to be used as hay in winter, and that's the practice we see in Heath's pictures. The marsh hay had to be cut while it was damp, so most of the cutting would happen as early in the day as possible, and the hay was left organized in large piles that went on wagons or were stacked onto staddles stakes driven into the marsh in a circle that raised the, the salt hay above the high tide mark. And in the case of the hay left on the staddles, the big piles, the stack would stay put until the fall and be collected by marsh boat or even until early winter when the marsh would freeze and the hay could be gathered safely by a horse and sledge. So in Newburyport marshes, we see all three aspects of marsh haying. We have the large haystack in the foreground, and that's clearly seated up on the staddles. You see the little logs there, and they're holding it up. There's a hay wagon heaped in the middle here, waiting to be collected. And there are the two cows at the water's edge, the intended recipients of all this hay come wintertime. The annual activity of summer marsh haying measured and marked the seasons for these coastal communities. But by the 1870s, it was being done more from habit than necessity. And by 1900, it was deeply affected by the mainstream modernization of large-scale farming. Haying was increasingly done by heavy agricultural machinery and then eventually stopped because hay could be imported uh, relatively easily um, and much more cheaply. When uh, salt marsh haying stopped, the landscape of the marsh itself was transformed. Now, Heath's scene of marsh haying demonstrates a deep interest in capturing a seasonal practice that was coming to an end. And in doing so, he demonstrates an interest in fixing a cultural practice that was uh, stopping. In a similar way, he's seeking to record seasonal and tidal change that occurs across a day, a month, and a year. As a tidal space, a marsh is a zone made different hour by hour as the water rises and recedes across the day. And as the time of day changes, the appearance and ecology of the marshland shifts. The landscape itself becomes an undefined space between land and sea. And across these pictures, I think Heed is asking, how do you paint something that hourly changes? So Heed's pictures really reflect on themes of unfixity and indeterminateness and inspire consideration of the passage of time beyond just an hour or a season, but from generation to generation. Now today, our marshlands have been radically affected by human activity and are in desperate need of preservation. 80% of tidal salt marsh habitat across New England has been destroyed due to human impact. The North Shore of Massachusetts, the site of Heath's Marshes, launched a major conservation effort in 2017 focused on saving the Great Marsh. And the project aims to reverse the effects of widespread historic ditching, where they cut those channels through the marshes. You can all imagine those, I think. Those really altered the ecosystem of the marshland and were done um, to uh, mark the space of the marsh for crops and boundary lines, and then in the 1930s done to drain the marsh as a form of mosquito control and to dry it out so that it wasn't that swampy nuisance at the edge of the, the water. Interestingly, one key tactic for the rehabilitation of the Great Marsh is the revival of the practice of harvesting salt hay which they'll start doing and then loosely layer into the historical ditches, filling it back in and letting it recreate the kind of pot, uh, peaty material that allows the marsh to um, operate naturally and as it should, capturing tidal sediment and rebuilding and restoring the function of the marsh as a space that fills, filters, and drains. So salt marsh haying, pictured by Heat in the 1870s as an increasingly obsolete practice, might now become the very route by which the marsh is preserved and repaired. Now alongside marsh grass haying, shoreline communities also relied on local waterways as food sources and captured salt from seawater. 
R. Swain Gifford's view of Peyton Aram salt works renders the structures of the salt work as pastoral and integral to the marshlands around them. Gifford created numerous pictures of this subject of the Peyton Aram salt works in Dartmouth, and this 1904 painting uses a kind of traditional composition to draw the eye into the view and across the flat open marshland with dramatic sky above. In the foreground, Gifford uses quick brushwork to convey pointy blades of marsh grass, and the texture and the color of the grass situates the viewer uh, very low uh, in the picture, almost as if we're lying in the grass itself. The salt works occupy the middle of the picture, and their distinctive triangular caps here, or roofs, are immediately recognizable. The ruins of salt marks dotted the south coast and Cape Cod. They framed a historical fact of life on the marsh for coastal residents. And as with Marsh Hang, communities took advantage of their proximity to the sea for accessing the rich resources that surrounded them. Salt was integral to 19th century foodways and served as a preservative and, whoop, oops, sorry, served as a preservative and flavoring agent. Solar salt is made from seawater through evaporation, and it requires broad open spaces. Marshlands proved the perfect location for this operation. Salt was produced from May through October, and the entire region of Southeast Mass was economically invested in the production of it. During the 1830s on Cape Cod, there were 442 salt works. And it's said that there were at least 13 different salt works alone uh, on the Aponagansett River in Dartmouth and more on the Aquishnet. For most of the 19th century, a salt work was located on Rickettson's Point, and another was built at Nonquit around 1827. And it's estimated that at its peak, the Peyton Aram works produced about 12,000 bushels of salt per year. Um, the salt works relied on windmills that pumped seawater into a series of open vats. Um, and every vat or cistern had this pyramidal cover that would swing over it in case it was raining and then sweep, swing back so that the sun could uh, beat down on the salt water and dry it out and draw out the salt. The salt would sit four and five inches deep when the process was done and then be shoveled into drying houses um, where it could then be packaged and sold. Now, as with many other industries, mechanization transformed the salt work industry. And in 1882, when drillers discovered rock salt deposits in the American Midwest, um, the mined rock salts rapidly overtook solar production. And much of the solar production here on the East Coast stopped. As salt mark, um, excuse me, by 1907, historian Albert Cook Church recorded that the very last salt work in the area, located in Peyton Aram, had ceased production and been dismantled. So the decaying salt works became relics of an industrial past for the region. And this transformed these remaining sites of industry to places of nostalgia and worthy of picture making. Gifford's painting of the Peyton Aram salt works then made around the same time that people were lamenting the erasure of these structures from the landscape um, speaks to this passage of time. And they also, I think, evoke a little bit the salt itself. So if you're looking at the picture from there and you notice there are flecks of white paint that lick the marsh grass and long streaks of white that sit across the horizon line. And I like to think of them as little gestures from Gifford, um, sort of invoking uh, the salt that is um, latent in these bodies of water. Today, over one third of global salt production is achieved by solar evaporation on seawater or salt lakes. Um, and studies to determine the sustainability of industrial solar salt production conclude that it is a sustainable industry, especially if it maintains local distribution. So if you can find local salt, I guess that's, that's one answer. The large open salt vats also support local wildlife and migratory birds. However, the sustainability index is affected by the fact that these studies identify seawater as a renewable resource and its salinity as a certainty. Now, rising sea levels, melting polar ice, and ocean acidification are challenging those base assumptions in alarming ways. Shoreline economies, uh, communities have always relied on their proximity to the coast. 
Uh, one final painting before we look to the Arctic is Lemuel Eldred's pastoral scene gathering clams in Fairhaven, which shows clamors raking the tidal flats of the Aquishnet. In the late 1880s, scalloping and cohogging for private consumption and public sale occurred across the Fairhaven shoreline. It is early morning, two clamors in the foreground, their sleeves rolled up to their elbows, bend down double to unearth the clams below the sand. And the small blue pools of water around them glisten with the river in the background. It's a true celebration of waterfront labor and a scene that would have been familiar, familiar for the local painter Eldred. His work really shows the reward that these clamors are getting with their quickly filling baskets. A photograph of clamors at Newbury, Massachusetts shows the kind of haul that working class clamors could bring in a single day. Now, the marshlands and estuaries of this region are a rich and vibrant ecosystem of flora and fauna and provide sustenance to residents like the clamors. The Aquishnet feeds into New Bedford Harbor, which itself empties into Buzzards Bay. And this unique environment is an estuary within an estuary. Now, much like the story that we're hearing again and again, the accelerated industrial growth of New Bedford shoreline for shipping and whaling, the textile industry, and later methods of production transformed the conditions of the estuary, causing much of the destruction of local salt marsh and the tidal and intertidal habitats around the area. Today, while we all know the port of New Bedford is one of the most valuable fishing ports in the United States, the local waterway, the space that we see here being clammed, can no longer be, um, can no longer be fished for shellfish. The dangerous pollutants and PCB contaminations mean that much of the area is closed to lobstering, shellfishing, and fishing. Indeed, shellfish often act as the proverbial canary for marine pollutants. And recently, the Massachusetts legislature has raised alarms over the ways in which ocean acidification and change to our climate linked to human action may devastate the shellfishing industry over the coming century. So what can be done for the future of these delicate intertidal zones, these places that are estuaries within estuaries? The final theme that I want to explore with you before we stop and hopefully have time for uh, some conversation is to think about how our current climate crisis is reflected in and magnified through historical paintings by William Bradford of icebergs and Greenland and the contemporary sculptures of Paula Winokur. Since the 1970s, um, Climate change caused by human activity has caused rapid polar ice melt, adding water to the ocean and contributing to sea level rise at an astounding rate. Recently, the mount melting of mountain glaciers and ice sheets is accelerating. They are rapidly diminishing and icebergs break off of them and fall into the ocean. In 2015, Philadelphia area ceramicist and sculptor Paula Winokur traveled to and photographed a Lulaset glacier on the western coast of Greenland. The Alula said Ice Fjord is a tidal fjord that covers over 155 square miles and annually calves 10% of all Greenland calf ice into the fjord, more than any other glacier outside Antarctica. Upon Winokur's return to the United States, she made a series of sculptures after photographs that aimed to capture the magnitude of icebergs. Iceberg split, the work on the right, stands as two hulking shapes formally connected but divided by negative space, a gap between a break, a cleaving. The porcelain pieces sit on a piece of reflective acrylic denoting the flat calm of an Arctic sea. The viewer sees the peak of the iceberg and imagines the unseen depth below, the iceberg tracing down deep underneath the water. Winokur aims to convey the powerful and awesome experience of viewing glaciers and icebergs. She also was interested in exploring ice core. And in works like this porcelain ice core piece, she adopts the scientific language of ice cap glaciology. These are cylinders of ice drilled from ice sheets and glaciers that are frozen time capsules, allowing scientists to reconstruct climate far into the past. In Winokur's hands, the deposits of the ice core read like scars embedded with glaze. The porcelain is smooth and white in some places and twisted, buckled, and wrinkly in others. And her work inspires deep consideration of the impact of melting polar ice on marine health and our planet. <clears throat> 
But Winokur was not the first artist to travel to Greenland and find inspiration in glaciers and icebergs. Between 1861 and 69, William Bradford made eight expeditions to the Arctic. In 1869, he voyaged to Greenland and reached 75 degrees north before returning home, accompanied by two Boston-based photographers, John Dunmore and George Richardson, who captured over 300 images of the Arctic landscape. These contribute to a lecture tour and the 1873 publication of the Arctic Regions. One of Bradford's oil sketches demonstrates his study of light and the effects of reflection on the surface of the iceberg and the water. It's important to remember that while photographers traveled with him, they could not capture the surface quality or the changing light and conditions of color that he would have seen while he was there in the Arctic. So you can tell that he's really trying to get that luminous green pool of color of the iceberg. The two twinned icebergs here have roughly textured faces and the bands of blue streak down them before disappearing into the water. The work is almost a double portrait. And there's an intimacy between them, a tension between the forms that have cleaved from a glacier together but broken apart. And they share the same harmony as Winokur's work. They are a call and a response. Imagine Bradford and Winokur, one in 1869, the other in 2015, separated by 150 years, watching glaciers calve and icebergs rise. For Bradford, it was about excitement and adventure. For Winokur, it was tinged with urgency. Uh, Winokur herself noted of her material, porcelain, quote, our climate is changing much more quickly than expected, and the glaciers are melting and receding rapidly. My choice of porcelain is deliberate, it can be delicate, fragile, and transparent. In that sense, it resembles glaciers, ancient, towering structures made fragile by human action. So the direct and simple forms of Bradford and Winokur's work maintain and convey the tension of our moment, a kind of call and response. The question now is what will we do? Okay. Oh, we've got about 10 minutes to talk. Uh, if anyone has questions, if anyone wants to look more at some of these pictures, um, uh, I'll pause for a minute. Um, so the question was about putting together the exhibition and, and making choices and marrying things from the museum collection with things from private collections and, and institutional lenders. And it, I mean, it was a great pleasure and a joy to put it together. And I hope that people enjoy and feel that when they're in the space. Um, it, it was truly an opportunity from my perspective and working with the museum's collection to take things out of storage, many of which had never been exhibited before. So we have um, unique examples of material culture, of ceramic, of um, items from our photography collection, works on paper from local artists, um, many of which were coming out of kind of deep, deep <laughs> storage. Um, and setting those into conversation with these stunning, incredible works of art by names that you would be more familiar with to think about how landscape itself permeated from the very top. I mean, the paintings, those are elite objects, right? Expensive at the time, um, collected by, by people who um, had the means to do so. But you see landscape in the exhibition in prints and you see it in, in China, you see it um, in things that would have been really affordable for anyone. So landscape wasn't just the sort of um, elite form. It was so, um, it spoke to so many different people that it showed up in all these different formats. And so I think what we've pulled from the collection hopefully provides that kind of uh, counterpoint or that note to show how pervasive landscape was um, and how popular it was with so many different people. Um, but it was, it was great fun to think about um, which stories we could tell with landscape from what we had in the collection and, and from these amazing collections that we had to work with.
So these are two good questions. So one, how did I decide which works would be included? Uh, and two, why is there a geographic stopping point? Um, and mostly it's space. You know, we have a, a pretty intimate exhibition space, and so um, you want a, a tight topic that, that people will engage with, um, but it also has to have a, a stopping point. I mean, I could have gone on forever. We could have traveled to South America. We could have gone uh, all over the place. The landscape tradition existed everywhere, and it wasn't just an American tradition, right? It was happening all over the place, South America, um, uh, we've already seen examples in England and France. Um, Canada had its own traditions. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we don't have exponential space. <laughs> so uh, um, you do have to be reined in by the realities of, of um, what we have. Um, and that exists anywhere, right? With any exhibition planning, you have to think about the, the space that you have and how you can tell a story that, that excites people. Um, so that was um, something that I really wanted to um, inspire people to think about some of those um, themes that we draw out in the exhibition. And that also then helped to determine which works would be included in the exhibition. So I knew there should be a section about coasts because of where we are. Um, and so looking at and thinking about different kinds of coasts, making sure there were marshes, there were dune scenes, there were cliffs, um, wanting to be sure that there were Hudson River scenes, that Niagara Falls was there as a really important tourism destination, um, wanting to make sure that women were represented, and so that meant we had a section on still life, and, and we had some sections that maybe aren't traditional landscapes, but that are certainly of the landscape and point to the landscape. Um, so those notes really helped to kind of dictate what, what would come and what wouldn't. Um, so. Could you speak to Ed, Edward Bannister's experience in um, open air painting? Mm -hmm. And Yes, absolutely. Thanks for that question. Um, so, uh, Edward Mitchell Bannister, we have one work by him in the exhibition, and he was a, an acclaimed landscape artist. Um, he did paint on plein air, and he painted locally. He was a Boston and then Providence-based artist who spent the majority of his late career in the Providence area. Um, and he painted um, in landscapes in and around Providence and Rehoboth, um, wonderful scenes of the Palmer River. Um, he was unique in that he was an African-American artist that achieved a certain modicum of kind of success within his career and was able to establish art institutions in the Providence area, including the Providence Art Club and RISD, which he co-founded with a number of artists in the area. And those institutional structures and support networks that he built um, allowed him to really forge a career. Um, there are a few landscape artists of color from the period who achieved the kind of success Bannister did, but for the most part, they were excluded from the kind of institutions that allowed other artists to excel. Um, Bannister himself couldn't find an academy to enroll in in Boston when he was looking for study. Um, and so I think it's significant that he had to form those institutions himself later in his career when he had the, the kind of the, stand, the standing to do so. Um, so I'm not sure exactly that I answered your, your particular question, but I mean, I think, you know, Bannister, that's an interesting um, thing to think about landscape and access and who has access to the landscape and, and who often is excluded from the landscape, um, who feels comfortable in the landscape and who doesn't. Um, and also, you know, how we think about certain kinds of pictures as being indicative of a person's identity and the fact that Bannister chooses to paint landscape, which at surface level has nothing to do with kind of his identity. A lot of other artists in the moment who were African American felt um, either personal responsibility or, or pressure to speak to and picture the conditions of other African Americans in the United States at the time. And then that became championed by um, uh, many members of the black arts movement around the turn of the century. But Bannister is inspired by French painting um, and pictures the landscapes around him. Um, and so thinking about, is there anything different about his landscape at surface 
um, if we're looking at it? Um, are there ways in which his landscapes are somehow different from the other landscapes in the show? Um, are questions that I think are worth considering as we look at the exhibition. I don't think there are easy answers to those questions. I think it is important, you know, his, his identity. Um, but that's a whole, a whole discussion we could have. <laughs> I think we had one more question. Chrissy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the exhibition um, has three different ways, right, that we're thinking about landscape from the environment, questions about gender, and then thinking about um, race and native presence and absence. Um, and I want, I want people to feel like they're allowed to enjoy the beauty of these landscapes. They are beautiful. They are gorgeous paintings. And you know that should be a pleasure that people uh, revel in. But I also think there are ways that we can, again, think about what's not pictured in those scenes and what kinds of stories those paintings tell or don't tell. Um, and how we can come to understand that moment in different ways by thinking about what might be left out or, or what kind of sits at the margins. Certainly women painting still lifes don't traditionally get talked about when we think about landscape, but there they are. And I mean, I think their paintings of fruits and flowers have as much to do with the beginnings of horticulture and botany and the design of the landscape as a traditional landscape picture. So um, that maybe didn't exactly answer your question, but um, yeah. So, uh risk of repeating yourself, maybe. Explain the word reframing and why you chose that. <laughs> so it kind of piggybacks off Chrissy's question, I think, which is, um, so why reframing? Um, I think a lot of people think of a picture as framing a view, right? And we think we know what landscape painting is and does. You know, I started out with that photograph. We think about landscapes as windows. Somehow their, their artifice is really... Um, different than just a portrait or another kind of work of art. It's, it's easier to look at them and forget that it's sort of, it's, it's a painting, right? It's something someone made. Um, and so inviting people to kind of reframe that or, or rethink their expectations and ask different questions than maybe they have before was the hope of the show. So. Yeah, it's a good question. So why are, I'm going to paraphrase that a little bit, why are Western landscapes so much bigger and kind of seemingly grandiose? Um, and I think part of it is timing. By the 1870s and 1880s, the artists who are going to the West are artists who are doing big exhibition pictures. And they want to create paintings that tour and that travel. And they're getting paid by the railroad to make those pictures and by mining interests. And then those pictures travel back to the East Coast and they circulate in Washington, D.C. and other places where they can influence politicians. And I think the bigger your picture is, the more influential it is, right? Um, I think it's certainly caught up with the moment of the 1870s and 80s, too. Those are the, kind of the peak periods of westward expansion, development, um, the peak period of what are known as the Indian Wars, um, and the active kind of removal of Native communities from the Midwest and the West. And those huge pictures of the Rocky Mountains, um, you know, they, they feed a fantasy and a romanticized view of what the West was, mostly to audiences on the East Coast. Um, not that these other pictures don't do that, but I think the, the timing and the period and, and the intent of those pictures maybe were a little bit different. Um, but it's a good question. It's hard to categorically say, you know, one group did this and one group did that, because there are always exceptions, right? I mean, there are stunning, huge pictures by some of these artists, too. Um, so, 
All right. Well, thank you everyone for hanging in there. <laughs> um, Hopefully we don't uh, all feel too deflated by our environmental moment here and, and see some hope in these pictures and, and these uh, activities that are happening all around us. Uh, if you are feeling inspired to explore your local landscape, I'll just give one plug. Uh, we've been very lucky to partner with three local land trusts, with Sipican Land Trust, Dartmouth Natural Resources Trust, and Westport Land Conservation to offer guided walks between November and April. So you should be getting info in your email about those. They are free but you will have to sign up because they'll have limited numbers. So thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening.